maybe I can ask a quiz, quick question um, to, to the Japanese scholars and practitioners in, in the know. Has the Alone Against the series been translated into Japanese? Okay, then just Pedro. Uh, one quick point, just sorry, before Pedro, just to answer that question as well. Um, I spoke to Mike Mason uh, in Chaosium about this, and he said the game books haven't been translated to Japanese, but that the starter set, which includes Alone Against the Flames, has been translated into uh, Japanese and Polish and I think possibly one other language I can't remember off the top of my head. So the oh. starter set would have that for the newest 7th edition, but I'm not 100% familiar with the Japanese version of it, and I think the system is a slightly not quite the same edition. Um, or uh, maybe the now they are on par. And now they are, okay. Now they are on the 7th edition. Great, okay. So the starter set should have Alone Against the Flames, translated to okay. Japanese. Should. And sorry, Pedro. Mm. Uh, so, Peter, uh, I would like to know, um, if, for example, you know that uh, in 1984, uh, the Fighting Fantasy game book, House of Hell, was very uh, was a very polemic game book. Uh, it was a mind-blowing game book. But in, in, in that time that people uh, didn't know very well about uh, RPG or this kind of games. Uh, do you think in, in this uh, current century, uh, if uh, uh, our game books or our literature, whatever, uh, will be a problem to some uh, religious fanatics or uh, people of this kind of groups or communities. Um, I that's a great question, and of course we know the satanic panic that went with Dungeons and Dragons in the past. I think and I hope that um, the religious fanaticism of that has uh, dissipated. I think there will always still be certain groups who view it as. Um, uh, as sacrilegious or, or, or devil worshipping and stuff like that. Uh, certainly some games like in, in Dungeons and Dragons you actually would summon demons in, in the game uh, which would of course be terrible for from the point of view from of those people um, but equally there, there could be a pushback on uh, other uh, sides as well. For example um, Call of Cthulhu Alone Against the Wendigo was renamed to Alone Against the Frost uh, for cultural sensitivity reasons. And one of the respondents said uh, that he hated the fact that they changed that, saying it was kind of political correctness gone wrong. And he said, because of that, I gave this book a lower score and I'm not going to play it again. And um, equally, uh, some people have had negative um, uh, views of uh, H.P. Lovecraft because H.P. Lovecraft um, has had, uh, sorry, he's dead, uh, had uh, extremely racist views as well, um, including naming his cat the N-word and uh, some of his stories are incredibly racist. And there are a lot of people who say we shouldn't play Call of Cthulhu and we shouldn't uh, uh, you know, uh, consume uh, cosmic horror because of his political or, or his his uh, cultural views as well, um. So I think that probably all the time, and I'm I'm not even saying that that's particularly or as unreasonable as the satanic panic was, but I think there will always be um different groups of people who oppose uh, well, you know, al almost every form of entertainment in, in some fashion as well. But I think personally that uh, these days we are um we are more open and as the rpg game has expanded and people have uh, uh, uh people understand it a lot more than maybe it, they did before 
I think that people are more open to the idea of the game uh, of uh, these as well. I hope anyway. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Lee, please. Thank you so much, Patty. It was interesting, and I'm glad that you were invited and encouraged to uh, give your take on that particular um, part or piece of, of game book uh, uh, genre. I, I don't want to use the word genre, but because it seems yeah. to, to limit something that's so interesting. But it reminds me of the Hellboy movie and uh, Hellboy movie, and uh, so Cast a Deadly Spell, mm -hmm. and also the video game Alone in the Dark which was very terrifying. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> when you describe uh, and, and really highlighted, let's say, the solo nature of the adventure, it reminded me of testimony I heard from a, a trafficking survivor. Mm -hmm. and, I th and she described her experiences and what happened to her for a long time after this traumatic ev life event as being in survivor, survivor mode. Wow. But that relates to... What, what you were describing and, and maybe what uh, Ole said about how it's, uh, or someone else had said it, about having to, oh, Marco said, you have limited choices when you're on your own. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're always in survival mode. And I wonder if, if this type of game book would be a vehicle for people, even if they had anonym, anonymity anonymously mm -hmm. as a way to get them out of the horror you know, as because look at we, we're talking mostly about in terms of entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. People wanting to go into these experiences, maybe they could be used to help people get out. That is an incredible point of view for that. I hadn't thought of that at all, but it would also make uh, perfect sense because um, in RPGs in general, we get to um, take on these roles. It can be an incredible way to build up empathy for for other people as well, especially games which are set in the real world. So Call of Cthulhu, for example, is set in the, the real world with supernatural elements, um, but uh, that helps connect it more so uh, than like a fantasy game set, set in, in a, a magical kingdom. Um, Call of Cthulhu, the, the people that we inhabit in those uh, games uh, we really develop a lot of empathy for that kind of situation. Um, but like you said, it can be a way for people to, um, you know, uh, go through these situations in a more uh, safe environment as well. Um, it would be extremely interesting. I have zero background in psychology, so I can't uh, offer anything there. Um, but as you said, it would have to be very, uh, anonymous and very careful as well because um, exploring these uh, feelings and these experiences again can be extremely liberating in certain in, done correctly and depending on the situation but it can also be extremely regressive as well if it triggers that person's uh, negative memories negative emotions um, if they can't come out of it but I think that that is an incredible um, idea yeah and I think Using uh, either uh, group RPGs or even solo game books can be a great way to kind of work through those um, those issues. So yeah, fascinating idea. I hope I hope uh, you or I or both of us do some research on that. It would be great. Yeah. Um, if I briefly may comment, um, just very recently a documentary was was um, shot and released about um, therapeutic tabletop role playing games mostly. Mm. Um, I will try to to look it up and and post a link uh, uh, in in the on Discord. Um, I think this will be our last question. So Marco, please go ahead. Everybody else, um, the oh. symposium may stop at eleven o'clock, but um, the Discord server never sleeps. So um, uh, please uh, continue writing comments and questions there. Okay, Marco. Oh. Okay, so two responses to what Peter said. Uh, one is uh, we had for a long time the feeling that maybe the satanic panic helped D&D because mm -hmm. it freaked out the parents. And at the same time, it made kids very excited for teenagers who yeah. mm -hmm. liked the idea of doing something forbidden. That has been actually demonstrated recently in the book by John Peterson, mm -hmm. The Wizards. 
in which it looks at how much money TSR made year by year. And there's no doubt when it becomes a multi-million huge rich company is during the satanic panic. That's when they did the best. They sent this message like, oh, no, moms, we really want to hear you. We'll say, yes, keep complaining <laughs> because we never made this much money. The other response was about Lovecraft extreme racial views. Uh, I wanted to add a bit of context uh, from somebody who lives in the U.S. and studied U.S. history. Sadly, sadly, Lovecraft views were not extreme at all. They look extreme mm. because he put them in writing. You look at the Dunwich Horror, that's a metaphor for the fear of racist mixing. But that was in the law. In the law of the United States, people of different backgrounds could not marry. So you had all the people that voted for those laws, that voted those politicians, they were perfectly okay with that. They had the same horror that Lockhart had, and they put him in the law, didn't write a short story about it. Uh, it gives disgusting descriptions of people of African descent, Italians, Poles, people of Hispanic descent, everybody. Even the Irish are not white enough for Lovecraft. Um, at the same time, while he's writing that, you have race riots. You have lynchings. People go mm -hmm. out there and they actually murder people on the base of race. And lynchings were large public events. Schools let out early so that the parents could pick up the kids and bring them to see the lynchings. Uh, there's a huge bibliography about this. My point is this, and I'm not saying this so it's clear. Sometimes people talk about that to, to give, excuse Lovecraft. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that we blame both Lovecraft and a society in which that was sadly normal. What I'm always worried about when people talk about Lockcraft racism is that we blame him, which we should, we should. But in so doing, if we if he's more racist than average, then we are letting we are exculpating other people. We are letting other people off the hook. Because I'll tell you this: if a guy who writes short stories with racial stereotypes in them is the most racist person in society. That society is better than it was in the United in the 1930s. Yeah. It's probably better than it is now in the United States. Mm -hmm. There are people who do worse stuff than writing that. So I just want to basically I'm giving you my perspective to hear what you think and to give you when the topic comes up. I found that that's an effective way of making Locker relevant, mm -hmm. not just to crucify him and somehow then everybody else looks less racist but to talk about a society that enabled that, that normalized that, in which that was sadly, sadly normal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for the comments. Uh, the first one, Satanic Panic, uh, yeah, definitely helped sales. It's the exact opposite of what the, 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 the parents were looking for, and it played perfectly into TSR's hands. Uh, so maybe we should drum up a bit more controversy about Call of Cthulhu and... Uh, and, yeah, uh, up, up yeah. Let's say how, yeah, let's how bad it is. How it yeah. teaches kids uh, to worship Satan, which has nothing yeah, to do with yeah. Lovecraft, of course. Um, as for the second point, yes, I uh, I am not as uh, intimately familiar with American history. Um, my view is that it was uh, incredibly racist at the time, and uh, that is actually one interesting uh, concept for playing Call of Cthulhu because. Uh, the traditional game is set in the 1920s, uh, where racism is rampant. And in the uh, core rulebook, they suggest to the keeper that uh, depending on the group of players, you can have this as a factor in your game so that they can kind of explore, you know, kind of from an empathy kind of point of view, what it was like there. Or if it's going to uh, disturb or uh, your players or make it so that they can't enjoy the game then you can kind of uh, ignore that as well. But I think you're absolutely right that we do have to acknowledge that there were really terrible things. And like you said, not just terrible individuals, but that it was actually enshrined in law. The only reason that I say that Lovecraft was particularly racist um, is based not uh, 
because I don't uh, uh, have as great a historical uh, idea of the time set, but two of the biggest Lovecraft scholars, S.T. Joshi, um, has talked about how he was particularly, Lovecraft was even uh, particularly racist at the time. And Sandy Peterson, um, who created uh, Call of Cthulhu, um, talks about that as well, how even for the time Lovecraft's, um, what he was writing, uh, his his views were particularly racist. Uh, but I do definitely, uh, so I would cede to them based on their more experience in it than I do. But I absolutely mm -hmm. agree with you that uh, Lovecraft's words, uh, even if they were particularly racist, uh, pale in significance to the actual actions that took place there as well. And you're right, uh, we can say Lovecraft was racist, Lovecraft was bad, but um, the society that enabled it as well was really terrible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's okay. possibly a distortion mm -hmm. because he put it into sorry. writing. Sorry. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Um we are unfortunately running out of time. Um uh I think the, the scholarship on, on Lovecraft is 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 extensive. So please share also um uh what you just mentioned in, in the Discord. And um for the last two to three minutes, maybe um Pedro can can find some some closing remarks before um so I switch the two last items in the program and would like to give Pedro a few minutes for, for some closing remarks before I um, uh, preview our next year's special issue. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank, thanks, Zoe. Uh, well, I'm very happy to have this, this opportunity, as I said. Uh, here in, in my home country, in Brazil, it's very uh, difficult to publish, for example, a, a, a STEM issue like what we are doing in Jarps. Uh, so uh, I I like it uh, a lot. All the, the, the articles uh, we, we received, it was very, very good for me. It was my first, uh, it was my first theme issue as a, a guest advisor. Unfortunately, I, I got very sick and I couldn't, could, couldn't help uh, as I wish, but uh, everything is, is it's done and it's perfect. Um, so I'm um, some closing remarks about game books. I I'm very uh, optimistic. Um, I feel uh, reading your your all your papers that uh, now we have some cards on the table and we can uh, show to them and think about what what we gonna do next. Uh, not not about the the uh, think about the future of game books, but uh, what we have now and what we can do with this, uh, and what is still lacking. So it's a start, and I needed this start even uh, for my own researchers, of course. So uh, thanks a lot again. Yeah, thank you. Pedro, thank you to all our, our presenters. Um, the issue is currently in its in its HTML form uh, only. Um, it takes a little longer until we have the PDFs with DOIs and so on already. I will uh, announce that when it's there, but um, everybody can already read the articles and hopefully um, use the issue, use the Discord server to uh, connect and um, uh, do some more, more research together. And um, as for the, the future of, of um, uh, JARPS, um, our next um, special issue for 2024 um, will be in collaboration with um, uh, Michael Freudenthal and um, uh, Michael Freudenthal. And um, the topic is going to be access and accessibility in role-playing games, solo role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games, live action role-playing games. The exact call for submissions um, mm -hmm. will be released in December. So stay tuned. We will submit, um, send it around again on the usual channels and um, uh, look forward to, to more contributions. So um, thank you all very, very much for today. 
And um, yeah, please continue the good work. Have a great um, uh, rest of the weekend. For some, it's still more. For others, here in Japan, it's it's already night. So um, yes, mm -hmm. thank you again all very, very much. And looking forward to more. And um, Pedro, all the best for you. Thank you all very, very much.